Are you ready to try your hand at placing your very first stock trade? Then check out our free guide, 10 Steps to Choosing Your First Stock to Trade, The Ultimate Beginner's Guide. In this free download, you'll learn how to choose the right kinds of stocks and how to find them, know when to buy your stocks and when to sell them, and you'll learn how to take your very first steps to becoming a stock trader and much more. Grab your free guide now by going to tradeway.com slash guide. That's tradeway.com slash guide. Hey guys, I'm David Mitchell, founder and CEO of Tradeway. What if God himself gave you a blueprint for how to handle your money? Well, the Bible is a practical book. Let's dive in and see what it has to say about wealth, about risk, about leverage, and about investing, and uncover how trading in the stock market can be a powerful tool for moving towards your biggest goals. We're so happy you're here. This is The Word on Investing. Hey guys, this is Ben Mitchell here, and today I'm going to be your host on The Word on Investing, filling in for my dad uh, today. Now, it's a real honor to have the opportunity to get to do this, and I'm looking forward to sharing some info with you guys that I personally care a lot about. I think you will too as we go through this. Uh, we're actually going to be talking about uh, a topic that is been in the news a pretty good amount recently, especially for those of you who do try to keep tabs on things related to gold, silver, precious metals, things like that. But really, even in most uh, you know, financial sectors, this is something that has been discussed uh, in the past couple of months. So I want to kind of hone in on it a little bit. And while this may not be the most comprehensive that it could be, in fact, uh, in some of our educational materials and our precious metals uh, education here at Tradeway, we do go into topics like this in a very comprehensive fashion, I'm going to try to summarize what we're going to be talking about to the point where it's simple, easy to grasp, easy to understand, and hopefully give you a little bit of context as to where we're at today and how this topic relates to us as individuals. So the topic is de-dollarization. So this is something, again, that has been talked about a little bit more than it has in the recent past because of some interesting developments that have taken place uh, over the past few months, you know, all within 2023. While this is something I've been watching personally for the better part of the last decade, I've talked about it in our precious metals education. Going back to the time we launched that uh, in 2017, a lot of our students are familiar with it, but it's new to a lot of people. And we'll get into the developments that bring this topic kind of to the forefront uh, today uh, as we move through the material here. But point being is that this has been circulating quite a bit. I wanted to talk about it and, again, give you guys some context as to why it's being talked about and how it affects us as individuals. So de-dollarization, what is it exactly? Well, in the most simple terms, as I can put it, it's the process of substituting our money, our U.S. dollars, as the currency for something else. Uh, now, you could get a little bit more specific with it. For example, uh, our dollar, and the reason it has so much dominance, is because it has been the main currency used for trading oil and most other commodities around the world. You may have heard the term petrodollar, uh, and that's where that term comes from. It's the fact that the U.S. dollar has been used as kind of the medium exchange in specific regard to oil and oil trading. Um, it also has been used quite a bit in a lot of bilateral trade agreements uh, among allies. And that's not just between us and, and our allies, but between other countries that, you know, are doing deals, trade agreements totally outside of the United States, just between themselves, they use the dollar for those types of agreements as well. So it doesn't mean the U.S. has to be directly involved with it in order for the dollar to be used in those types of agreements. And then, of course, anything that is denominated uh, in dollars, any dollar-denominated asset, of course, gives uh, rise to the dollar's dominance in that regard as well. So again, de-dollarization is a currency, something else substituting the U.S. dollar for those purposes. It's not necessarily a new phenomenon. Um, it is somewhat complicated. It's not necessarily very easy to actually do, even if countries have been talking about doing it for decades at this point. 
it's not very easy to actually accomplish because it's complicated. There's a lot of things that go into it. It requires a number of very carefully calibrated economic components, legislative components, regulatory components. Obviously, there's a lot of fiscal and political implementation as well uh, in order for it to actually work. This is one of the reasons why it hasn't um, been a great concern for a lot of people all this time, and certainly not for our financial leaders such as the Fed or, frankly, any of the presidential administrations of this century. None of them have cared about this, or to put it, I guess, in better terms, they haven't given it its due. They haven't put their attention on it because they just, frankly, haven't been concerned with it. Uh, We're actually going to get back to that idea here in just a little bit, but it is just a fact. Now, before we get into the concept of de-dollarization in its full form, we kind of need to give it a little bit of context in and of itself. And obviously, you can't have de-dollarization without first starting with, well, what is dollarization in the first place? In other words, what is this system that we are moving away from? How was it instituted? And what are some things that have happened to get us where we're at today? Well, after World War II, the U.S. had the most leverage of any other country in the world to bargain a new international monetary system. There were a lot of countries, most of our allies um, were in severe debt after the war. And of course, it took just a massive financial burden. It caused a lot of financial turmoil among all of those countries. And it was it was a burden that many of them could not bear. And it was time after centuries of England being the dominant superpower in terms of uh, monetary systems and um, among other things, it was time for the U.S. to step in and utilize that leverage that it now had and restructure, totally restructure the international monetary system. There was something, I'm not going to get into the details of this. We do talk about this a lot in our metals education, but there was something called the Bretton Woods uh, system that was created back in 1944. It was basically bringing the dollar now at the helm of international trade. So after the establishment of that system, of the Bretton Woods system, the U.S. dollar was then used as the medium for international trade, again, from that point all the way up till today. Uh, The United States Department of the Treasury, um, it has exercised considerable oversight uh, over a number of, you know, agreements and transfers, financial transfers, financial networks that, again, are on an international scale, not just here in the U.S., not just domestically, but internationally. They have had a lot of oversight and a lot of power over those things since that time. Now, because of that, we have had a huge sway. The United States has had a huge sway on the global financial system with the ability to, as we're very familiar with as of last year, they have the ability to impose sanctions on foreign entities and including individuals as well. Uh, The U.S. presidential administration started imposing uh, financial sanctions on Russia shortly after the invasion of Ukraine uh, last year. And so we have had a lot of power because of the fact that we uh, were able to, again, leverage our power and bring the dollar at the forefront in terms of financial dominance among other currencies all around the world. Okay, now remember, I'm talking about dollarization for a minute to give us a little bit more context as well as history, why we're even talking about de-dollarization today. Now, the 1944 Bretton Woods Agreement was the ultimate source of dollarization in the first place. It's what put the entire world, the entire international monetary system on a dollar-based system. But dollarization usually happens, if we want to bring it into a little bit more of a kind of a present day uh, context now, it usually happens when a country's own currency starts losing its usefulness as a medium of exchange. That could be due to hyperinflation. It can be due to just political instability uh, in general. And it actually happens somewhat frequently, even though we don't hear about it very much these days. You know, we think about inflation being around, you know, 7% or wherever it's been recently. And we think of that as being pretty bad, which I would say it is, by the way. But then you consider a country like Turkey that has 88% annual inflation, or Iran that has 52% annual inflation. Argentina also has 88% inflation, and Sudan has 103% annual inflation right now. So dollarization has been a very useful measure for a lot of countries uh, in the past 
that have literally had to use the dollar to save them from total financial collapse. I'm going to give you guys an example of that here in just a little bit. Now, naturally, most of the time, dollarization in our day occurs in developing countries with a really weak uh, central monetary authority or just, again, an, in general, unstable economic environment. It can occur as an official monetary policy or as kind of a de facto uh, market process. Now, either through official decree or through adoption by market participants, the U.S. dollar becomes recognized as the ultimate medium of exchange in that country. It's used for day-to-day -day transactions uh, in that economy from that point forward. And sometimes the dollar will just assume official status as legal tender in any given country. Again, there are a lot of examples we could look at, and I will give you a specific one in a little bit. But that's the point, is that it can happen at any time, and the dollar for the last 80-plus years has been used as a way to bring developing countries out of so much political and financial instability into a more uh, prosperous environment. The main reason for dollarization is to receive the benefits of that greater stability and the value of uh, currency and all that good stuff. And, you know, just as one example, the citizens of a country within an economy if it's undergoing rampant inflation, like it is in, again, Venezuela or in other countries as well in uh, South America at this very moment, if citizens see that this is happening, rampant inflation is happening, they may choose to use the dollar, if they can even get their hands on it, to conduct, you know, their day-to-day -day transactions, their day-to-day -day purchases, the very source of their well-being, putting bread on the table and all that kind of stuff. And they do that again because inflation will eventually cause, if it hasn't already, their domestic currency to have totally reduced its buying power, its purchasing power to nothing. They can't do anything with it anymore, so they have to replace it with something. Now, I told you guys a minute ago we would take a look at a, a specific example of dollarization as it is used today. And this is a big part of just the history of it, how it works. And I just want to give you guys as much context as possible for the issue at hand today. In 2008, Zimbabwe reached an estimated annual inflation rate of 2.2 million percent. It's just crazy to think about it. It's almost uh, incomprehensible to us because, again, we are over here um, struggling with the fact that our inflation rate is somewhere around 7 percent, um, has fluctuated between 6.5, 8.5 percent over the last uh, couple of years. And to us, that's staggering. So we can't even begin to comprehend what it would be like to have a 2.2 million percent inflation rate at any given time. Well, this is what Zimbabwe was experiencing again back around 2008. And shortly after that, what they did was they announced that the dollar would be accepted as legal tender in that country. So basically, the acting finance minister came in. He announced that the U.S. dollar would be accepted um, and that people could start using that as legal tender. And he started by using just a select number of, of merchandisers and retailers is kind of an experiment. But after the experiment worked and he saw that this is actually something that could bring his country out of, again, financial demise, they adopted the U.S. dollar officially by legalizing its general use for uh, a number of years. And that became reality in about 2009 or so. They totally suspended the use of their own currency um, when they got to about 2015 and started exclusively using the dollar. Now, as soon as it was official, what happened was uh, the inflation problem was totally fixed. Uh, their inflation rate was immediately reduced. And dollarization in Zimbabwe became the very thing that kept them from, again, total financial demise. This reduced the instability of the country's overall economy, not just financially, but politically as well, um, not just within the economy, but really across the board. It allowed its citizens to increase their buying power for once, and economic growth actually started happening. Now, in addition to that, long-term economic planning became a lot easier for the country because the stable dollar attracted some foreign investment for once. This is something they didn't even get to, you know, take part in for a number of years because their domestic currency was so hyperinflated, no one was even thinking twice about it. Now, here's the thing. The dollarization, even though it did bring them out of that financial turmoil that I've just described, it wasn't entirely a smooth ride for the country. There are some drawbacks to a foreign country um, utilizing dollarization in order to fix their, their monetary system. The reason is because all monetary policy would be created and implemented by whom? Well, 
not the Zimbabwe government, because they're using United States dollars. It would be the United States, more specifically the Federal Reserve, some thousands of miles away from Zimbabwe, that would be making all of the decisions that affected monetary policy and the strength of the currency that Zimbabwe was now using. So again, decisions made by the Fed does not take into account the best interests of a country like Zimbabwe when creating and enacting policy, and the country had to hope that any decisions that were made, such as open market operations, things like that, that it would actually be beneficial to them and not detrimental to them. But again, they had no control over it. It was just hope. Not only could Zimbabwe not make its goods and services cheaper, uh, in the world market by devaluing its own currency. This is something that countries do all the time. In order to help their exports, they actually purposefully devalue their currency. Well, Zimbabwe couldn't do that right now because, again, they're using the U.S. dollar. So, in effect, the dollarization actually made it a little bit tougher for them. It, in some senses, in terms of regulation, in terms of monetary policy, it discouraged foreign investments from other countries. If the Fed decided to do something that, again, Maybe they devalued the currency when Zimbabwe didn't necessarily want it, or maybe they strengthened the currency, therefore hurting their exports. A number of things can happen that is totally outside of the control of the finance minister of Zimbabwe. So, again, dollarization has its drawbacks as well. Well, when these drawbacks come into play, fast forward to 2019 now, however, they reversed course and ended up outlawing the use of the U.S. dollar. It's a crazy turn of events, even though it, again, saved them just a few years prior to that. In 2019, Zimbabwe reversed course. They reintroduced their own currency. It was a new Zimbabwe dollar known as the real-time gross settlement dollar in February and outlawing the use of the U.S. dollar and other foreign currencies in June of that same year. Inflation in the new Zimbabwe dollar then began a steep incline and lo and behold, the use of U.S. dollars was now permeating the black markets of Zimbabwe. And here we are, Fast forward to 2023, their financial struggles still persist because in order to fix one problem, they had to do away with the dollarization that they had just instituted uh, just some years prior. They did away with that. They instituted a brand new currency, and now that is experiencing massive inflation rates and people are having to use dollars on the black market because it's no longer legal tender. Uh, again, inflation has been steep ever since they did that, but they have stated that they have no intention of going back to the dollar despite those challenges. And it kind of makes sense, guys, if you think about it. If you are a country thousands of miles away, you don't necessarily want the Federal Reserve of the United States dictating your monetary policy. It makes total sense. Now, let's talk for a second about the gradual fall of dollarization and move into where we are today while we're talking about basically the opposite of that. Again, the actual topic at hand here, that being de-dollarization. So how did we get to where it started to shift? Since the Great Recession, going back to just 2008, we're back into our own, you know, home territory here, talking about the United States. Since the Great Recession, a lot of foreign countries uh, have been discussing the need to, as they put it, quote, de-Americanize the international monetary system basically means the exact same thing. They want to move away from the U.S. dollar and move towards something that isn't linked to America. Again, they want to, they want to de-Americanize the international monetary system. They've been cutting trade deals with each other, a lot of these uh, countries. They've been increasing their gold reserves within their own central banks. Again, this has never really manifested itself as any kind of real problem, any kind of threatening problem, until you fast forward to this year. Then all of a sudden, the floodgates really started opening in Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. All these countries, they've been talking for a long time about setting up a monetary union. They've been talking about it for decades, really. But again, all of a sudden, things really started to happen. And many other countries, as well as those, are wanting to do the same thing now. You got countries like Argentina, Indonesia, Turkey, Mexico, Saudi Arabia. They're all getting these ideas now and really thinking through how they can make this happen, how to actually manifest a new monetary system that removes the dollar out of the equation for them. So now you may be thinking, where do they get this idea from? Well, Brazil and China are the ones that started it just on March 29th of this year, of 2023. They struck a deal on that day to effectively ditch the dollar in trade agreements between themselves. They announced that deal again on March 29th, and it enables China and Brazil to carry out trade and financial transactions directly, exchanging yuan for the Brazilian currency and vice versa, 
rather than using the middleman that they all want to avoid, the U.S. dollar. They don't have to convert their currencies to the U.S. dollar first. They can just go directly between themselves. So again, this is the big thing that I believe is the first domino to fall on many things to happen in the near future. Now, is this meant to be some alarmist, you know, rhetoric here? Absolutely not. I'm not trying to say these things to get people freaked out and thinking they need to go sink their uh, savings account into gold and silver or anything like that. In fact, the large majority of the international system is still very much so using the United States dollar as their medium of exchange. However, these are things that we do need to be watching because, as we have examples of even throughout the Bible, but certainly throughout history as well, we need to start being prepared when we see some of the writing on the wall because there are implications that we may not even yet understand uh, and how they would affect us as individuals, in our families, as a country, all of our local communities. How is it going to end up affecting us? Well, you got to remember, we have been on this relatively new experiment of global fiat money systems only since 1971. Prior to that, there were all, always some form of tangible monetary systems where the monetary system was tied to something like gold, something like silver, um, some form of tangible commodity. Whereas in 1971 and forward, the entire world is now using what's called a fiat money system, which just means the money itself is not tied to anything real. That is a relatively new experiment in the grand scheme of history. So again, the implications are somewhat unknown when things like this start to happen. So this entire topic is all about considering these things and wondering, you know, how could we be prepared for it moving forward? What does this mean for us? Well, I'm going to leave that uh, with you guys for today, and we're going to pick this up in our next episode because we have more to cover in terms of what exactly is happening now. Again, what are the implications of this deal between Brazil and China? How does that affect us? And what are some of the things that have happened even since then? That's what we're going to be taking a look at in the next episode of The Word on Investing. And listen, guys, if you like this episode, if you like any of the episodes on The Word on Investing podcast, please rate and review our show so that people of like mind can find it and engage in this material as well. We really appreciate it. And of course, we'll see you next time.